Hello and welcome to our session uh, in Unit 2, Module 1, about measuring concepts. Today we're going to focus on particularly about costing and the importance of costing, and we're going to go through some definitions about costing. But to start with is why, why is this a, an important topic that we cover? For any business to be able to make money, they have to incur some costs, and then they have to know what these costs are, and then ultimately so that they can do the proper pricing. So if you have a, let's say, a, a restaurant and you're focusing and you're selling sandwiches, you need to know the cost of these sandwiches, meaning that what, what goes into these sandwiches, the bread, maybe the meat, the cheese, the, let, the, the vegetables and so on. And we need to know how much these things cost. So that's important, but that's not enough because in the restaurant, you're going to pay for rent, you're going to pay for water and uh, utilities, you're going to pay salaries for your employees and so on. So therefore, one of the most important things that we need to understand is to be able to come up with a full costing structure, understand what are the costs that goes into the, re the reason that we are in the business for, in this case, making sandwiches, so that if, for, the, for example, we know that the total cost of a sandwich is $5, we know that we have to sell it above $5 so that we can make, we can make some profit. So therefore, in order to understand that, one of the important things is to understand what is costing and how does costing behave and how do we keep track of costing. We will learn that there are two types of costs, mainly what we call direct costs and indirect costs. Direct cost is the cost that we can directly trace to our uh, our own uh, uh, purpose of business. Like in the case of the restaurant, the direct cost of the sandwich would be the bread that we use, the cheese and the ham that we use, and so on and so forth. And the time of the person spending time to prepare the sandwich. Why? Because we are able to measure clearly for every cost that how it relates to our sandwich. So I will know I'm going to use one loaf of bread. I know that I'm going to use maybe 30 grams of cheese, 40 grams of ham, and so on and so forth. So effectively, these direct costs are costs that can be directly assigned to our product. On the other hand, we have to find a way to charge part of the common costs that we have, the indirect costs, such as maybe the salary of the accountant in the restaurant, the, 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 the um, cost of utilities and so on. So these costs are very general, but we need them to be able to produce the sandwich, which means that I need to be able to allocate part of these costs to every sandwich that I'm making. So therefore we have what we call indirect costs and indirect costs, or we call them sometimes overhead costs, these costs, there has to be a mechanism where we capture these costs and then allocate them to the number of sandwiches that I'm, that I'm expecting to sell. So to start with, let's start with some basic definitions. The cost objects, cost objects basically is the resources or activities that serve for the basis of management decision, which means that in the case of making the sandwich, this is my final product. I want to know how much material goes into it, bread, ham, cheese, lettuce, tomatoes, and so on and so forth. And I need to know, in addition to that, what are my indirect costs? So for us to make some life simple for us from an uh, accounting perspective, we break down costing, as I said, into direct and indirect. And direct costs, we have them in two categories, direct material, which is the material that actually goes into the process and the direct labor, which means the actual time of the person, in our case, preparing the sandwich or working on the machine or um, whatever the case may, business that we are in. So these are costs that can be what we call them directly attributable to that product. On the other hand, we have the bulk of the other costs, which we cannot directly trace to our process, we call that manufacturing overhead. So that when we classify our costs, guys, we classify them as the direct material, direct labor, and overhead. But then we subcategorize them. We actually will take the direct material and direct labor, and we say the total of these direct costs, we are going to call them prime costs. Why prime? Because they are primarily, primarily directed and attributable to the, to the final good that we are doing. But then what we take is we take a further subdivision where we take the direct material 
and overhead, and we call them conversion costs, which means these are the costs that we'll take to convert our raw material into the final product. So again, going from an, our analogy of a restaurant, these are the costs that are going to take the bread, cheese, ham, lettuce, and so on, and make it to a final sandwich that we package and we sell. So again, be, when, you're, when you're looking at, when you come across some questions, please be comfortable with the definition that prime cost is direct material and direct labor. Conversion cost is direct labor and overhead. So the direct labor could be in two definitions. So that's the first thing that we need to understand about costing. The other thing is we need to understand and get a deep understanding on the definition between product cost and period cost. What's the definition? What's the difference between them? Product costs are costs that go into the cost of inventory. And there are the direct material, direct labor, and overhead, which we kind of covered. What about period cost? Well, there are a lot of times in, in, your, in your business costs that relates to selling general and administrative. So let's say in your, let's say in, in your restaurant, uh, you bring uh, stationery and coffee and so on for the staff. That does not go into the cost of inventory. That's classified as SG&A, selling general and administrative. And also, if you're borrowing money, if you have a line of credit, you're paying some interest expense. So we actually distinguish between, we call them period costs because these are expenses. They don't get capitalized on our balance sheet as inventory, they get expensed in the income statement. And because for, them, for us, these are period costs, we are going to incur them and use them. And they are necessary, but we cannot track them as part of the manufacturing process, whatever process we are involved in, whether it is, as we said, Making a, making a sandwich or manufacturing a table, but they are not kind of the primary functions, they are supporting functions accordingly. So anytime you see selling general and administrative expenses, these are not con considered part of the inventory cost, these are actually considered part of the uh, expenses which fall, go directly to the income statement. Remember, in the income statement, your only expenditure is when you sell, because that's going to be cost of goods sold. So your inventory will be credited and you will debit cost of goods sold and that goes into your income statement. Otherwise, as long as it is inventory, it's a capitalized cost and it's part of the inventory cost that is sitting on your balance sheet. Okay. So if we are going to say that the costs are direct and indirect and we say in our factory or in our restaurant, we have those indirect costs, which are, are related to making the sandwich or relating to making the product, but they are not directly traceable. Common things that you may come across, they, you will get a question where they will tell you, well, there is a, uh, the salary of the supervisor. Well, the supervisor is supervising people who are doing the product, but he, he or she is not directly involved in the product. And therefore, if these cannot be directly traced to the product. So you, can say, you cannot say 0.01% of the supervisor time goes to the, the sandwiches that we made today, for example. So what to do? To make life simple, simpler and traceable and, and, and justifiable, we speak about creating a cost pool. I, I think the best analogy, if you think of a pool as a bucket, where you have, you know, you just throw everything in it. And at the end of the month, you come and say, okay, I have $1 million in my overhead pool. How will I be able to allocate them? And then typically what you will come across is that what we call an allocation base. So a, a basis and a logical basis for, the, uh, for allocation of the overhead. Now, depending on the nature of your business, you may, you may use what we call a cost driver such as direct labor hours, it could be direct machine hours, depending on the nature of the business. But the general concept is when you cannot trace a cost directly to its source, like to the product, that's considered indirect or slash overhead cost. And those overhead costs have to be gathered in the cost pool, and then there will be an overhead application rate. So that you can say, based on this, I'm going to charge that much money for the product. So if you want to put some, some definitions, basically, cost pools are collections of cost elements assigned to cost objects using a common basis of allocation. Fancy terminology to what we explained, but it's important to keep in, keep in mind that we only need that because we are not able to track 
the, the, the cost directly to the product and therefore they are classified as indirect cost. So what will happen then is if our final product is a table or a sandwich, your direct material and direct labor are directly traceable to that cost object, which is the uh, sandwich. Now, remember, why do we need the cost object? Because I cannot do pricing. I need to know that my sandwich is costing me $5, so I will be able to sell it at a certain markup. Otherwise, I might be selling before below the markup, and I will end up losing money, which is not something nobody wants to do. So that direct cost is a very simple process, you know, and we, what we do in reality, guys, in business, and we did it in our manufacturing operations all the time, is we come up with what we call standard costing. So if I go to the guys in our aluminum business and I tell them, how much material do you use per certain window profile? They will tell you, well, on average, we use that much kilogram for that much product, that for that final product. And I tell them how much labor is directly involved based on our historical timesheet we come up with the standard rate of a uh, standard rate also but then when we talk about the rest of the manufacturing cost this is where we need to decide on what we call an overhead rate at application so if we, on this slide we distinguish between the direct and the indirect and what we basically say is that the direct costs are easily traceable as we said the indirect costs are not easily traceable to a cost pool and therefore we need to accumulate them and then allocate them. In reality, what we do is every manufacturing organization, and by the way, manufacturing doesn't always mean, uh, doesn't always mean machinery and so on. Manufacturing, even a restaurant is a manufacturer. They manufacture sandwiches. So anytime you have labor and material involved, this is a manufacturing process. And this is where you start needing to break down your cost into direct material, direct labor, and indirect. And when you accumulate those, you can see them as indirect material, such as cleaning supplies, safety equipment, indirect labor, you know, the staff that are working on the, in, the, in the place of operation, specifically in the factory itself, the workers, the cleaners, and so on, supervisor costs, and so on. And then there is obviously the insurance, the utility, the taxes, and so on and so forth. And this will be other, other indirect costs. Okay. So that's the first thing that we need to keep in mind when we capture the cost. The problem, however, a lot of businesses started uh, ch challenging, is challenging for a lot of businesses when they started was, how, will my, how would I break down my cost? Let me explain. The last two years have been pretty harsh with the pandemic, and a lot of places uh, suffered, especially the hospitality industry. So in North America, there was lockdowns, and they would come to you as a lesson and say, you cannot have people sit down in your restaurant. So you can only live on delivery. So, and some businesses had to shut down and, so, and lay off people and so on. So one of the things that businesses were struggling with, if you come, especially for sm small to medium-sized enterprises is, how will I survive? How much do I need to survive? What will be enough? And then one, the most important question has to be answered by, understanding how your cost behave. And basically your cost, it can behave in one of three ways. One is what we call fixed. Two is what we call variable. And three is what we call semi-variable. So let's break it down into its component. Fixed costs basically are costs that you have to incur with, whether you are producing or not. So restaurants will have to pay rent. Whether they sell 10,000 sandwiches, or they shut down for the whole season, the rent, the landlord doesn't care, right? They are expecting their rent to be paid on time. Same thing for insurance. These are what we call, guys, fixed costs. Fixed cost means that whatever, whether you're shutting down the business or you're producing, fixed cost doesn't care. That lump sum of $10,000 has to be paid every month. Now, this is an important understanding if you're a business owner, because you need to know what you can control and what you cannot control. Because if you tell me, you know what, I'm going to shut down for a month, I will tell you there is no need for your direct material. You can also give your workers a one, week, one month vacation. So direct costs that are variable by nature, which means that you will incur them only when you produce, are considered variable costs, which means it's under your control. If you produce more, you will pay more. 
if you produce less, you will pay less. So a business can argue, well, you know, if I want to cut down my cost, I will produce less. But where is the problem? The problem is not in the variable cost. The problem is with the fixed cost, because the fixed cost, you cannot do anything about it. Now, on the long term, and this is what we will talk about the relevant range. On the long term, you can argue, listen, I'm going out of business. I will make an early payment for the rent, and I will exit the rent. Yes, but in this year, and this is always very important, costing, we always analyze it in short term. In this coming year, fixed costs are beyond your control. You already committed to pay rent and insurance and so on and so forth. So that fixed cost is a burden on you, whether you like it or not, whether you produce or not, whether you sell or not, you still have to cover it. Okay? So to understand the costing behavior, we distinguish, as we said, between three types of cost. Fixed cost, and this is basically does not change as the cost driver changes. Back to my restaurant example, whether you sell 100 sandwiches a day, 10 sandwiches a day, or 500 sandwiches a day, fixed cost doesn't care. You still have to pay the 10,000 rent and insurance and so on. Fairly simple. Variable cost, on the other hand, says, you know, well, if you don't, if you're selling 10, 10 sandwiches, you might need one kg of, of cheese. If you sell 100 sandwiches, you need 10 kg of cheese and so on. So variable cost goes up or down with your production. Okay. So for us to make it simple for us and to, for businesses to be able to operate, we made a very important assumption. And the assumption is that the variable cost is changes, is fixed per unit. So if you say, I need one kilogram of cheese for 10 sandwiches, I'm going to assume that the, there is a fixed rate of cheese, meaning that it is going to be 10 kilograms, uh, it is going to be 100 grams per sandwich. So the unit is fixed. So variable cost is fixed per unit. So you say, it's going to cost me $3 for, the, for my material for the sandwich. Whether I produce 10 or 500 or 1,000, it's going to be always fixed per unit. Although the cost total in value is variable, but it's fixed per unit. Now, this is going to be very important because later on, we're going to see that uh, we're going to learn our, the ability on to how to predict the cost for every company. And one of the major fundamental assumptions is that there is a linear relationship between total cost, fixed cost, and variable cost where you have a fixed cost, which is a lump sum amount, and the variable cost, which goes up and down, but at a fixed rate. This is where it's very important. You can see on the slide, it says constant, the constant per unit. The total dollar value or amount changes, but its amount is fixed per unit. Okay? And this is basically direct material and direct labor and other components. The last bit is a bit tricky. The last bit is a, what we call semi-variable cost. And this is basically the two most applications that you will come across is the first one is in the utility. So you, the way you pay your utility bill in a lot of places in North America and the US and other places is that you pay a fixed surcharge and plus a rate on consumption. So every year, every month you have to pay, let's say $30 and plus the consumption will, depending on your consumption, you pay more. So your cost of the utility is semi variable. On one part, there is a minimum surcharge, and this is going to be fixed even if you switch, switch off the, the, the electricity completely. And the other part is going to be variable because it varies from one, from one consumption, depending on the time that you consume, how much you consume, and the timing, and so on and so forth. So that's a very common example that you might come across in real life and in exams. The other component is what we call the uh, compensation for salespeople. So typically, your company, if you're a salesperson in a company, they may come and tell you, I'm going to give you $1,000 as a base salary. And then depending on your sales, you're going to get 5% commission on every sales. So if you sell nothing, you're going to get the 1000 That's your fixed component. And the more you sell, the more you get. Now, you can argue that, well, I'm going, if you don't produce as a salesperson, I'm going to lay you off. That's true. But remember what we assume we have what we call a relevant range. We are assuming that within that specific period, could be one year or a quarter or whatever, you cannot change things very, very drastically. So typically, if you hire somebody, you might, give, you might want to give him one or two quarters until they perform. So in that time, 
you are paying their base salary and that's a fixed cost for you, okay? So this is important, guys. But now we are able, with these assumptions, we are able to come up with a formula to the total cost. So we can tell an owner, for example, that, listen, you need to sell 500 sandwiches to cover all your costs. This is a pretty powerful statement. And you cannot do it with those kind of, without understanding the cost behavior, the cost pool, the cost object, and some of those assumptions. So when we look at this graphically, you can see that when you look at the column in the middle, which is the yellow line, you can see that fixed cost. Uh, this is a this is a, a X, X, Y axis, Cartesian system axis, where we are plotting price and quantity, okay? So you have dollar value here on, on the Y axis and the quantity on the X axis. So note, uh, notice how fixed cost is. If your quantity is zero, or if your quantity is one million, the, the yellow line does not move. What does the yellow line tell you? I don't care what your production is. Your fixed cost is $10,000 per, per month. That's it, end of the story. Until you do further analysis or you do further changes, that's beyond your control. However, look at the variable. Variable tells you when your quantity is zero, I start with you at zero. And as you produce more, I am going to go up. My costs are going to go up, but is the trick. I'm going to go up at a fixed rate. So for those of you who remember math, when you're looking at the line, this is what we call the slope of the line, which means the rate that the line is going up. And that rate, that slope is fixed per unit. So every time you buy, let's say it's $3. So when you produce one quantity, it's $3, two quantities, $6, three quantities, $9, and so on and so forth. So that's a pretty powerful tool when we want to analyze, right? So what does this mean effectively is when we look at the semi-variable, it's a mixture of both. Semi-variable will have your yellow line, which is the fixed, like the example of the salespeople, you pay them $1,000 as salary. On the other hand, as you are producing the cost, as you are producing quantities, you're paying them more. So it starts at the basic level and then goes up and up and up. Okay. Remember, on the y-axis, you have the cost, the dollar value. On the x-axis, you have, you have the quantity, which means, guys, that we are now able to put the total cost in a linear equation, which gives us a very powerful tool to predict our cost behavior and what do we want to do. Now, keep in mind, this is what I told you. Everything is within the time frame and the relevant range assumes short term concept. You can argue that in the long term, everything is variable because you can get rid of the rent, you can buy a building. Yes, all that 100% understood. But in the short term, when you are making business decisions, you have to accept the fact that there are fixed costs and variable costs in your formula. And you can actually see here. What we are trying in this slide to tell you is how the cost behave. And effectively, you can see that the fixed cost per unit drops. Let me explain that's a very important concept, which confuses a lot of students. So we agreed that you need $10,000 to cover your cost. Okay? That's your fixed. So whether you produce zero quantity or 10,000 quantities, it's going to be 10,000. That's in total. But the more you produce, the less is the fixed cost per unit. Why? Because you know you were producing zero, but now you're producing one, two, three, four. So what you will see is your fixed cost per unit. Be careful what I'm going to say because that's a bit confusing. So bear with me. The fixed cost is fixed, but your fixed cost per unit will decline. Why? Because a numerator is your fixed cost. Your denominator in your ratio is quantity produced. So the higher the denominator, the more you produce, given that the numerator, which is your fixed cost, is fixed, the downward the straight, the, uh, is going to be, which means that your fixed the straight line, the slope will be. So your fixed cost per unit is going to drop. Although your fixed cost in total doesn't change, right? It's still that yellow line. But depending on how much you produce, you're going to have your fixed cost per unit dropping and the more you produce. And this is why a lot of people tell you, if you want to cover your cost, sell more, right? 
you want to cover your costs, sell more. That's true because you have to have a minimum of ten thousand dollars after your contribution, which is your sales minus your variable cost, to be able to break even at least, you know, so that you will not take money out of your pocket. So therefore, please always remember that this is very important when you are looking that the variable cost is variable cost is fixed per unit. So we know that it's going to be $3 per sandwich or $4, whatever. But in total, your variable cost will go up depending on your production. Your fixed cost is fixed in dollar value, but it changes per unit. Okay. Great. So this is just a, this is just a part, first part of the lecture. I look forward to uh, hopefully meeting you in, in person online and other in some upcoming lectures. I wish you all the best. Have a great day.